All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce Henri Davis, my cousin, who has a bachelor's degree in computer information systems from Louisiana Tech and a master's degree in IT management from the University of Dallas. Great school. He is currently the VP of Connectivity Assurance at J.P. Morgan Chase and has about 10 years of work experience in IT and cybersecurity. As a security operations center lead, Henri developed playbooks and rules to trigger actionable alerts for the SOC analyst. He has experience working with client incident response, implementing new correlation searches by reviewing security events, tickets, and threat intel. And he worked with anomaly detection teams to tune and enhance the alerting environment. Henri has experience tuning the alert signals in EDRs, such as CrowdStrike and Tanium, and developed a new process in handling phishing alerts in the client environment. He mentored analysts on how to triage, communicate effectively, and how to manage a ServiceNow queue. He also maintained the block allow list to reduce false positives in Splunk's Phantom. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Henri Davis. Thanks for that wonderful introduction, Matthew. Got it. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And let's go to slideshow. All right, so how you guys doing? I'm Henri Davis, day in the life of a SOC analyst. Oops. All right. So Matthew pretty much already told you about me. So this is a brief about me now saying I like SecOps, the incident response. And currently I am a LinkedIn learning instructor. I'm a content creator, career coach, podcaster, you name it. I'm, you know, pretty much a, a jack of all trades right now. So here's my career progression to kind of show you guys the kind of realistic viewpoint of my career over these last 10 years. Started out doing help desk, then went to the knock, then finally got into cybersecurity, doing SOC work. Then I was a threat analyst for Optiv, and then I did that for like three years. Um, moved over to the financial side. So I did incident management at Goldman Sachs, and then of course, at JP Morgan Connectivity Assurance. So what is a SOC analyst? SOC stands for Security Operations Center. Exabeam's definition of this is SOC analysts are the first to respond to cybersecurity incidents. They report on cyber threats and, imp and implement any changes needed to protect the organization. Now, my definition of this is you are the first line of defense. Think of yourself like virtual policemen, detectives, paramedics, firemen. SOC analysts see all of the threats before everyone else does. How they triage and respond to the alert is critical. So here are some typical skills that you would need being a SOC analyst. Log analysis. I like to say, some people like to put, you know, you have to be like a master in networking, but I would say just basic networking skills, just understanding um, networking at a, you know, foundational level. Of course, knowing about the cloud, so the big three, AWS, Azure, GCP, OS, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Also, and one of the things that people, you don't necessarily have to have this on your resume saying attention to detail. You can kind of show attention to detail if you're interviewing and asking you how you would triage an alert, but attention to detail is a... Uh, pretty much very important here because when you're sifting through logs, you have to really pay attention to what you're looking at because sometimes you can miss something. But if you catch it ahead of time, you possibly can prevent something widespread from happening in the environment. Definitely soft skills, being a team player, uh, like Michael was talking about earlier when it comes to communicating and knowing your audience. So like well, if you're a SOC analyst, a lot of times you may be reaching out to people in the company about alerts you see that's involving them. Some of these people are non-technical. So knowing your audience and just give them the bare 
minimum information that they need and for them to either answer yes or no is pivotal instead of trying to prove how smart you are when you send them an email that they kind of just look at and won't uh, respond to. Um, knowledge of scripting. So, and I can really expand on this a little bit more. It's not necessarily knowing how to script per se. That's nice if you already know that. You can learn that on the job. But it's more so kind of knowing how to interpret these different scripting languages, if you see them in alert or, or something is going on, if somebody's doing something, you see a script being run that you don't recognize, can you interpret it and can you figure out what's happening? Um, knowing how to work phishing, knowing about identity and access management, knowing about endpoint detection and response, Titanium, CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, Defender, and malware analysis. So, According to salary.com, the average stock analyst salary is around $96,716. Now, I want you to take that into consideration. This may be anything that's titled stock analyst, which some roles don't have them by tiers, and some roles they will be tiered. So in some stocks, there is it's tierless. So that stock analyst could be making a wide range of things. So it just averaged out, and then based on where you stay, too. So when it comes to if you're ever negotiating, just kind of pay attention to like where you live, the cost of living, and kind of see what the average is just for that area versus the sure. average of the whole country. So here's the importance of stock uh -oh. in your organization. If you guys have been paying attention, these last couple of weeks, We've seen breaches everywhere. PayPal, LastPass has gave us some more information. Uh, Okta, and there may be some more that I'm not naming, right? Oh, Uber. <laughs> and every time these breaches happen, I always think about what did their SOC do when these things, these alerts first happen, right? And so I'm I'm always a little biased to say, hey, most of the companies that we probably didn't hear about, hear about a big breach, a big breach is that they have a good sock. I think a good sock can make or break you. And here are some of the reasons why. Socks give you 24 seven monitoring. We already know one of the things that attackers have against the company is time. So leveraging 24 seven monitoring really helps you out in the event that, you know, you get hit on, you know, weekend or holiday, you have somebody there, eyes on glasses, paying attention to that stuff. Threat detection. Incident response. Also, you need to have SOCs for compliance reasons for certain frameworks. Cost effective. You know, you may be paying all your SOC analysts maybe $120,000, but if you get a big breach, you might be forced to pay millions on top of spending money to rebuild that public brand. It helps with your security posture, helps improve incident response, and improves incident management. Now I'm gonna to touch on like some of the different type of socks. You have an internal sock where you're pretty much the sock analyst that's internal to your company. And you may or may not be grouped with the incident response team. Now, uh, some companies have moved to a form of their internal sock being called like a fire team. So where you do everything, where everyone that works in that team can actually do incidents from start to finish. Because mostly SOC analysts will probably do initial triage and analysis, and then they'll escalate it to someone who needs to actually go deeper and actually run the incident and remediate it and do anything else they need to do. Because SOC analysts' first job is to triage and detect, so they have to get back their eyes on the glass. Now you go to MSS. These are the type of SOCs to where they don't necessarily triage too much. They'll manage these alerts for customers and then kind of route them to the their clients. So their SOC team can actually handle the alerts. They kind of just route them to the right place. They probably spend maybe five or 10 minutes on them and then they send them off. They don't really do a lot of deep diving in them. And I would say MSS SOCs are cool. They're, they're a place that if you get an offer to do one, you can do it, but don't stay long because you won't have the skill set that people that work in other SOC environments have just because you'll be limited based on what you can do. Fusion centers. Now I worked in the fusion center for three years for a uh, big client. 
And so we handle everything in our fusion center. We had, of course, our SOC team. Then we also had platform engineers and we worked with the, the clients, their fire team. And I would say fusion centers is a, is a really good spot uh, because you get a lot of experience. You get to use a lot of different tools and depending on how big your client is, you really get exposed to uh, some, I'm going to say good and bad environments based on what they have set up in their environment and the logs that are coming in. So, and then the next wave, you have like MDRs, XDRs, um, companies that offer man and detections and response. They just outsource everything to the MDR company. So there is no escalating to the internal team. They are the people that do the SOC work and the incident response work. That's what they do. So they pay those guys some big bucks to do that. So a lot of times you'll get that from um, like companies like I used to work for, like I said, Optiv. Uh, now I think we're seeing DeepWatch, CrowdStrike has this. Um, Sentinel One probably has it. And I may be missing some other companies, but a lot of these pure cybersecurity playing company, Xpel. A lot of these companies that are doing this now, this is the service they offer. So like SOC as a service, they're offering this, you know, because sometimes you don't want to manage that <laughs> or you don't know where to start. And you may eventually be building out your SOC team, you know, from the ground up eventually. So, okay. We had a day in the life of a SOC analyst. So like I was saying earlier, most socks are broken into tiers. Tier one analysts typically have eyes on glass for their shift. And what this means is you're mostly looking at your SIM, checking the email queue, ticketing queue, and anything else that you have access to that requires monitoring. That's typically what level ones do. And these are some of the logs that you would potentially be looking at. Example of like your network log, so like your firewall, wall, firewall logs, in my case, uh, we got our logs from uh, Palo Alto. So we would use those in our investigations, uh, just seeing if we're seeing like some malicious uh, traffic with certain IP addresses, or maybe they're moving too many bytes out, trying to see what they're doing. AWS logs, so CloudWatch, CloudTrail, VPC flows, we get those from AWS. O365, so of course you got email, really anything that has to do with Office 365. Um, so that's a lot of logs in itself. And also, Microsoft has built-in security uh, things that can actually go into your SIM that even enhances like how you triage even more. Database logs, EDR logs, Active Directory, operating system logs, and then all going into your SIM. In this case, one of my favorite SIMs is Splunk ES because it could pretty much handle almost anything you throw at it as long as it's configured correctly. And that's what you would typically do. And I wish I could have got a picture of like showing you how it look, but you know, they come in, it's like incidents or notables and you work on like how you do your searching and know what you need to look for and knowing how to access all these different logs while you're searching for them. And that's the key. Like being a good SOC analyst is really knowing your environment. If you can learn your environment and then also learn what's normal and what's not normal, you'll do fine. It'll when you first start with no experience, it's like you might go down a rabbit hole for everything just because you don't know. You're just seeing some pop up. So you think it's bad. But once you kind of know that environment and know, hey, every day at 8 p.m. CST, this person runs these uh, these uh, SC tasks. You know, this guy is a uh, engineer or developer. He runs these tasks every day or whatever time. So that's not, you know, that's not malicious. We can actually try to get that uh, put on the, the block list or the white list so it doesn't fire. But yeah, these are these are some of the logs you will look at. And this is also, I will also tell you, this would probably be an interview question for you. I've been asked in the past, hey, you know, if you were, you know, going to start up like your environment, what type of logs would you want to ingest into your, your SIM, right? So these are some of the logs that you want to have in there. And you can go even deeper than what I have here, but these are just some I tried to make a little image for you guys to uh, look at. So when it comes to tier two and tier three, they typically handle what level one can't handle. And then a tier three person is typically a principal level person. So they are really very high up there and they do a lot of things from, uh, they're possibly a, a engineer for us, like with the SIM, they're probably making detection rules. They're probably making playbooks, use cases. If they worked in an environment like I did, they're talking to the client and probably scrubbing log sources so they do a lot so 
everybody in the sock is needed, no matter if you just strip all the tears away, it really doesn't matter. The goal is that we all work together to keep our company safe and help them to continue to make money. As long as you remember that, you'll be fine. Now, there are instances where you'll have people that kind of get a little ego because they have a certain tier by them. But most of the time, that'll backfire because teams don't like that. And they eventually, you know, resent them and either leave or they demote that person or send them to a different contract. Um, these roles typically have more experience than level one sock analysts. So with tier two, tier three, you're probably looking at um, three, four years, tier two, principal level, five, seven years. Yeah, that's what you're looking at. And you could probably get there faster than that, but you have to have elite skill set. So here are some some common sock alerts. And for those who follow me on social media, they know that I did some videos on some of these alerts, pretty much asking like sock analyst interview questions for people that are interested in being sock analysts. So you have unusual authentication, and these could be, um, you know, simple like you've probably seen this like uh, you get a new phone or something like that, and you try to log in somewhere, and you get an email from somebody saying, "Hey, did you just log on from here?" These kind of things we'll see like that, or you'll see someone, they may be logging in from somewhere they don't typically log in from. They may be traveling. So, or they may be logging in from a region that we've deemed to be unsafe. And that's like a red flag. So uh, those are some of the unusual authentications you get. Most of the time in, in every environment, you see like a lot of brute force. Uh, as people are trying to do password sprays on uh, usernames they might have found somewhere like on a dark web or something. But as long as your security tools are doing what they need to do, then there's not much to, to have to worry about when it comes to that. Uh, malware alerts, you got different alerts, persistent malware, uh, sometimes, okay, sometimes, sometimes just some ad I don't know, read the example. Okay. <laughs> uh, malware. And then a lot of times uh, we would get alerts with suspicious PowerShell application which doesn't necessarily mean it's actually anything malicious, but it's suspicious because based on the threshold and it fired, the system needs you to look into that. Um, a, user make, a user making unusual IAM events, S3 buckets made public, phishing, data exfiltration, and those are just some common ones that I just see from time to time in the environment. So, here are some of the issues that SOC analysts typically deal with. Volume of alerts. I can tell you from when I started to when I stopped kind of just doing SOC day to day, they kept on sending more and more logs at us. And the issue with that is if you're getting more logs, then you're possibly getting more alerts. So alert fatigue is really one of the main causes of why incidents occur. You see something so much and you don't think it's something. And then that's the one that gets you. It's almost like, you know, uh, what is it? The little boy that cried wolf, except in this case, it's an incident. Um, lack of context. So you can get a, a rule put into your SIM that you don't quite understand, or you go check out the rule and it's nothing written up on the rule. No one's ever worked it. So you're trying to figure out, okay, what exactly are we supposed to do with this rule? Like, is it actionable? What is it for? And so now you have to spend longer than what you have to on a rule that you've never seen before to hopefully get some context on it. Limited resources. This has come, this is still one of the issues, even with SOAR, they're still running into resource issues when it comes to SOC analysts, because like I said, so many logs, so many logs getting ingested and even having a elite team, you still can't help all that even with SOAR. It's just, it's crazy. Talent shortage is one as well. Everyone doesn't know how to be a SOC analyst. It's kind of, uh, before the last couple of years, people will probably just kind of lump being a SOC analyst like, oh, you're doing security help desk, but that's not the notion. A SOC analyst isn't really an entry-level role. It can be, it could be like zero to two, but someone has to know at least something because to pretty much have somebody that doesn't know anything is going to be super hard because you'll have to take time away from actually working to train them and get them to speed. And I think that's one of the things too, that people tend to have issues with sometimes it's like, it's both, I see both sides of that. 
but I've also dealt with having to try to train someone all the time that I didn't know enough. And then I couldn't get my things done to where I had to ignore them. And so that's why sometimes companies, even though you have like you had an attitude that you're willing to learn, that's why sometimes they may bypass you for someone who they don't have to teach that much to because they need them to be hitting the ground running they're probably like, you know, three months. Complexity, that's also one of the issues. Things get harder. New technologies, like when I first worked my first AWS alert, I didn't really even know what AWS was, let alone what the, what a bucket was. So I had to actually do research on that years ago and kind of figure out what was going on. And, and once I did understand it, it became a little bit more simpler for me. Keeping up with the latest threats is always a new threat. If you had bad threat intel and you don't know, like if everyone isn't doing the other jobs that goes in to make a SOC functional and efficient, it can be a long day for you. Lack of standardization that can go with logs, that could go with uh, things in the environment that's not standardized and that you're dealing with and you're like, man, what is going on here? And of course, like I said earlier, volume alerts goes right into stressful environment. You know, I've I've experienced in the past where, you know, <laughs> either something is broke or like all you did is probably just worked like so many different alerts or maybe the same thing. And it, it can really, it can really get to you. That's like one of the things, you know, people don't talk about a lot of times. So I did a video on that too, is where like what people don't talk about when it comes to working in a sock is some of these things. Now it's definitely, it definitely could be a career in a, in a perfect world where these things don't stop you. You probably will have a lot of fun in a sock just because of how many things you get to put your hands on and experience in a, in a good sock. I'll say that in a good sock. Some socks don't really kind of let you learn or do much. So you have to leave. All right. So I kept this really concise, but now the floor is open for questions. Hey. Well, I don't know if we're just supposed to talk or raise our hand because see Richard rose his hand. So okay, let me uh stop sharing and that way I can see who's doing something. Okay, perfect. There we go. Richard, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh thank you, Henri. Um since you work for JP Morgan Chase, uh, might to understand that you are in control of the entire environment, or do you have any third-party cloud platforms that do work for you in terms of your data storage and processing? So what they do is they have like an internal cloud that they like work on that they develop, as well as welcoming in, I think they're trying to push to AWS. Um on top of other things that they have, it's like a, it's probably like the largest organization I probably work with because they have so many different companies that they work with. It's like, it's huge. I'm st I haven't really been there. Well, I think I've been there long enough, but I was still learning stuff, you know, about their environment. Even just every time you just stumble upon something, not knowing, you know, what's this or what's that. But I think for the most part, they do what they have to do to be compliant based on what they have to do, especially by financial standards. And that's why from what I have known from working at like two different like financial companies is that they typically, they're very, they're much more strict. Like uh, you don't have like work machines, like your work machine is like a, a Citrix VDI on your machine. So they can kind of, tolerate a little bit more what you can and can't access on their network versus them having to worry about if they gave you a physical machine, what would you do with it? So they're kind of, they're kind of more locked down than other places I, I've worked with. Even, and that's probably even more locked down than government when I did work for TSA. Well, when I was a contractor for them. Yeah. Cause I mean, ultimately between, as you say, how strict it is, you know, banks need to maintain their, overall integrity of all their systems just as the government so has is there more of a leeway if you will to start farming it out to third-party cloud providers um probably so but they take so long to make changes just because that bank does want to make sure okay you know customer data is there is financial data what 
you know, what do they have access to, what they don't need access to, those things. So in big organizations, it takes forever to make a change. And I think that's why they're gearing up for the cloud uh, to just be more cloud heavy than they have been in the past. Thank you. You're welcome. I think Paige was next. Yes. <clears throat> so I'm currently working on an internal SOC team. We're actually mm -hmm. undergoing a pen test right now, which is a, a great learning experience. Um, but I guess in in your experience as a SOC analyst and in the many roles that you have worked, um, and, and we also work with CrowdStrike, like Falcon Complete, you know, the identity piece, all we have all the bells and whistles really with Cloud, CrowdStrike that kind of handles the initial triage of a lot of alerts. Um, do you believe that you would get, or which roles do you feel like would gain you more experience, a more well-rounded experience, or um, as a SOC analyst, would it be something more like the CrowdStrike where you're kind of seeing everybody's um, information or what's happening on a majority of clients' devices or the intimate setting of an internal team where you're kind of working more on phishing, you're doing kind of the SIM stuff and and, and that's currently like what I do. I do the phishing and I do the SIM and Microsoft Defender and all of that. So just in your experience. Yeah, uh, good question. I would say actually what you're doing now because you're internal and most of the time, even if you're, if your role was just regular SOC analyst, but if you're internal, you have access to everyone else that does something and you can get, you know, you can learn from them or you can start shadowing them and then maybe even start helping them with projects. And that's why I brought up earlier by like the fire team. So I think kind of what, what you just, uh, just said, I think that what you do is kind of like the fire kind of framework that they're doing to where you can learn that you know so much and i would say like you're in a good position i would cuz you you're learning a lot and i'm glad that you said you're also working on the pen test and all the other things you're doing because a lot of people don't know a lot of times they do just think if you're in a sock like hey you're not doing that your eyes on glass you're not you don't know anything like the they really typically think it's the mss sock that i described where you're literally just looking at all these different uh service now tickets for different clients and routing them to the cloud and say you need to work on Okay, thank you. No, no problem. I kind of felt that way because like what you were saying, I kind of felt like, okay, I feel like I'm in a good spot, especially when you listed out exactly what it is SOC analysts do. And I was like, I feel like I, I do a lot of that stuff, even though I just started my career in, in doing this yeah. a few months ago. So thank so you. So Hano, how long have you been doing it? Since May of last year, I was actually in the military beforehand, um, got pulled away from security, had to do military engagement. Then I came back like about two years later and reintegrated myself. I was more on like GDPR um, and kind of policy side and compliance. Mm -hmm. And um, and now I'm over on the actual SOC and security yeah. side. Yeah, you get to see like, like I said, a lot of the, uh, the SOC teams now, cause they're, you know, they have like, you working with like the Threat Intel team or you got the people that are making the rules or the engineers that are upkeeping the systems. Um, then you have uh, what you call you call these people now like threat modelers. So now you can work with like people who are threat modeling for different things. So you're in a central place because of, a lot of this stuff is designed to help the SOC. So yeah, definitely stay there as, as long as you can. You know, as long as the money is right, stay there. Absolutely. After this, I'll be watching your how to make two hundred thousand dollars as a SOC analyst. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's a that's a good one. That guy on there actually does uh forensics too. He's a forensics subject subject matter expert. Okay. Any other questions? Because I can't see everybody's screen, so I just see Paige right now. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Okay, Javon, were you about about to speak? Yeah, I was. Gonna, I, I raised my hand. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Yes. Go ahead. Um, hey, HD. Um, you know, really glad to be able to hear you in this forum. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, just to piggyback on um, Paige's comment, I'm in a similar environment where I decided to work on an internal security team rather than um, a SOC as a service. And I used to have similar concerns, you know, 
not but because one of the things that I, I wondered about was in a fact as a service you deal with incidents much faster than when you're on an internal security team you're exposed to projects yes and so on but for I kind of want to head in the incident response um, become an incident responder in the long term and I'm starting to wonder now am I in the best position where I'm at now given that incidents don't happen as fast because I'm the client I'm dealing with is the business I'm working with internally. So any advice you have there, appreciate it. Okay, so I'm trying to make sure I understood it correctly. So are you, what are you? Is your SOC internal, or are you guys like a fusion center for like a client? So we we have a managed detection and response. Okay, gotcha. But I'm not the managed detection and response. I'm ah, so y'all work with them. Y'all work with the MDR team. Yes. I mean, gotcha. totally. I'm just a security analyst on the security team within the company. Got you. So what I would probably advise you to do is, because you probably know how to do everything up until the incident. I would see, and it may be hard because you guys work with them. So there's two ways you can do this. One, see if maybe one of those people that you could possibly build some type of relationship with and see if they could welcome you in in a sense of like showing you these different things. Cause the thing that probably prohibits people from moving into incident response is just the lack of knowing how to work incidents and what to do. And if you could learn that from them, then that's perfect. You know, your skill set is already fine because you already know how to do the information to get the information, but then they're going to want to do, okay. There, it's going to be more so two things, knowing how to do it. And then the policy part of it of like, Okay, boom, we have all these compromised accounts, you know, what are we going to do? What's the first thing that we should do? So knowing that part of actually going through it and be able to speak to it in an interview will be huge. And this is from personal experience, a person that had to uh, figure out what to do when he's trying to move into incident response coming from just doing pretty much initial triage and the, the level two stuff and then giving it to the IR team, you know, having to sit back and wait to what they find in an incident. So that's one way you can go, or another way you can go is try to find somebody through LinkedIn and network with them and, and see what they say and how they help you, maybe what type of labs and stuff to do. Um, they do have good different labs out here now. Well, courses, I'll say not, not labs, but courses that are kind of inexpensive where you can learn some of these uh, things to do. Like, for example, uh, I like uh, the malware analysis course at uh, TCM. It's like very inexpensive and it kind of walks you through set up your own environment and you kind of learn how to analyze malware. Granted, most EDRs that does a lot of that stuff for us, but the things you learn doing it manual and going through like these different API calls could be some of those things you could speak to when it comes to trying to get an incident and response. So I hope that answered your question. Thanks. Yeah. So, so um, more in response to what you said, more or less the um, one going the offensive role, learning offensive to leverage for incident response role would be a good way to segue into an incident response role. Well, yeah, you. I mean, I would say in any role, if you're in a blue team, if you know how to do some red team stuff, it makes your job, understanding your job a little bit easier because you kind of know what to go look for. So yeah, definitely. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Henry. Uh, I just had a quick question. Okay. So basically, you, when you spoke about SOC position, you said that before accessing to a SOC or applying to a SOC, we need to have some sort of skills. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest as skills needed really needed to be in that position to get into that position? Sure. So I had a slide on it, and I'll probably also uh, send this slide deck out that way you guys can go back and review it but um the standard things knowing about operating systems networking basics of you know security knowing about the cloud the cloud is actually one of the things now like in the past they used to tell people hey go get your a plus network plus and all that now i tell people to kind of forego a plus and go straight to one of those entry-level cloud certifications Right, because two things, you know about all the services in the cloud and you do labs while you're trying to get that certification. Uh, so knowing that, knowing about phishing, um, 
like I said, one of the big ones is, and there are trainings out there where you can learn. Like, you, of course, you got the try hack knees, which is cool. I've been playing around with it a little bit, so it can be beneficial. Uh, but it's only one. It kind of only shows you kind of like the way that they like to do things. But all in all, if you were able to go through that many things and you started doing your own, like I think heard you talk about doing CTFs or you know all these different like boss of the socks and all these things like that, doing those, recording them, talking through them. Um, that would, that would be for me now, because I've interviewed people to work with me on the sock before. For me, that would interest me. Okay. Hey, okay. What have, what have you worked on? What type of skills you have? If I give you a, a scenario, can you think enough in the right direction to where I say, okay, this person don't have all the experience, but they're really close and they already, you know, thinking on the right terms. Cause that's the biggest thing. It's like, for people to make their transition to be a sock analyst, it's the thinking part of it. Once you figure out how to think and you have a method for almost every lecture to work, because most of the time the, the method is going to be the same, but the things you may look for be like different. Once you can do that, you can prove that in the interview, then, you know, you'll be doing all right. And and that's the reason why also for those that follow me, I have uh, my sock analyst interview questions pinned on my LinkedIn uh, profile for that very reason. Right. You may not know every one of the questions I have on there, but it does open your mind and say, okay, this is what I need to work on. Right. This now, this is why, you know, they tell me to learn these port numbers when I was studying for security plus. This is what, you know, can happen if they're leveraged, you know, in the right or wrong way in the environment. So um, I hope I answered your question. But like I said, I'll sum it up again, you know, OSs, knowing about the different services. Um, this is one of the reasons why some of us that work security would advise someone to sometimes work help desk because you learn about some of these things, these different services, these different things you can do with uh, Active Directory in the help desk role. You learn about RDP and running PS exec. So if you see it as a SOC analyst and you see, hey, who's who's using PS exec? Is this person a, a person on the help desk? What, what's going on? And then that will make you kind of go into an investigation versus people who's never seen it before. They're kind of just, they don't see why it's an issue when it fires. And one more, one more question, sorry. What sort of certification, because I know that now to talk about certifications, it's what's booming in LinkedIn and everything. What sort of certification as an entry level would you like to see in an applicant? Cool. Um, so the funny thing is when I've interviewed in the past, I rarely asked about their certifications only because I know most of the time certifications you can study in like a week or two and pass it if you want to. So to me, it's not that important. However, what I do advise people to get now is like what I said earlier. So I would say like an entry level uh, cloud certification uh, whether it's AZ900 or the AWS Cloud Practitioner or the entry-level uh, Google pl uh, Cloud Platform certification, then you get Security Plus. And I'm trying to think, is there another one? You can get those two. And then some people like to go CCNA or Network Plus. I would say as long as you kind of understand networking, you know, you should be, that should be good enough. And then from there is when you say, okay, boom, let me go learn the skills that I see on these SOC analyst job descriptions. And now the skills that I've learned, let me create a project that can mimic some things that I may deal with on the SOC in a day-to-day. Uh, -day. And those are the things that when a recruiter sees you and they're trying to get you for an entry-level role that they're going to be interested in. Especially, I'm telling you now, like a lot of hiring managers will ask you, hey, do you have a home lab? So if you don't have a home lab, that's one of the things that you need to set up because they want to know, okay, on your off time, what are you doing? How are you how are you staying better? How are you staying relevant? So if you can work on those on your own free time, then, you know, you have no issue. The search is just a thing sometimes for HR. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, hi uh, Henri. Uh, my name is Robert. I have a few questions. The first okay. question is, uh, uh, where can I go to start my home lab? I, I've heard a lot of websites, but I want to hear from you. What home lab would you recommend that I can start? Sure. So 
there's a there's a lot of different places. Like um, one of my good friends, um, his name is Day Spring. He has a also a YouTube channel, Day Cyberwalks. He has um some videos that he did on like his uh home lab that he set up. And this is probably what going on maybe two years ago. And now he's doing um cloud detection engineering for Datadog. You can check him out. Uh it's also a YouTuber by the name of Josh uh Matacor. He has a and this is one that's pretty cool too. So the reason why I like Azure versus AWS is because Azure will let you set up a cloud instance. You're able to use uh, Microsoft Sentinel. You can put Microsoft Defender on VMs and you can make your own lab. Josh Matacor has a lab of helping you set up Microsoft Sentinel and um, using a VM, taking the firewalls and letting it get brute force. And then you're tracking um, where did the different attacks come from all over the world. And then you're making a dashboard with it. So those are like two off the top of my head. That's, so that's one point to the question. The second point of that question, or the second part of the question, is that what I was just telling him earlier about learning the skills that you need to do the job and then making your own project. That's what I also advise as well. So, okay, you know, if you go, I advise people, and some of the stuff I'm saying now, I also have on my YouTube channel, it's a um, free webinar that says how to get in cybersecurity in 2023 with no experience. So, I cover this on there as well. But I say, hey, go get five to 10 SOC analyst job descriptions and look over the, the requirements of what they want you to know. Write those down, the ones that appear over and over again, and then go learn those skills. And then try to combine those skills and make a meaningful project that a company would deal with. So if now, if you've made a home lab, you say, hey, I, I made a, a, a SIM, I made uh, content rules with Cigna, um, I analyze these different, you know, malware samples. Uh, I set up this ticketing system. So all these different things that you're doing is things that somebody would do as a SOC analyst that they would be interested in. Thank you so very much for answering my question. Uh, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Um, okay. On top of uh, creating your own home lab, uh, what would you recommend um, completing a lot of virtual labs through TriHackMe? Because I've been doing TriHackMe for about a couple of months and uh, I've learned quite a bit. So if I combine a home lab and TriHackMe, would that be easier for an aspiring cybersecurity professional to transition to cybersecurity from whatever field that, you know, that person may uh, come from? Yeah, I would say try hack me is definitely a start. The reason why I don't tell everyone to just go all in on try hack me is because everyone is doing try hack me. So my advice is always to help people try to stand out. And so one part of it is learning the skills and the work. But then the next part of it is actually non-technical and it has to do with just marketing and branding yourself. That's what uh, earlier when they were talking about how Michael's been posting more on LinkedIn, you never know who's watching. So it's that part too. It's like, and I, I kind of touched on this like slightly, but I should have touched on it more during the presentation. Soft skills, you know, do people like you? Do they want to work with you? That's going to be huge, especially when you're working a, a job that possibly uh, that does like shift work and you need to count on that other person or they need your help for some or vice versa. Or you have to possibly be customer facing where you're talking to different clients and getting information from them. Those soft skills are key. And a lot of people overlook them because they just focus on Oh uh, man, I could write, you know, I could write malware samples. I can do this. I can do that. But you know, their people skills are not good. And a hiring manager will look at that and they will give you a big thumbs down based off that alone. Absolutely true. And yeah, fortunately for me, I have a lot of experience dealing with end users of all races, all, all you know, philosophical views, all walks of life. And I've also uh, spent almost 10 months in Japan providing IT support to both Japanese and American end users at a couple of military bases. So it, it really helps me a lot when it comes to surrounding myself with, you know, like-minded people. Yeah. And I would say also for a tip then, 
you possibly could use your job search to focus on jobs that want you to know Japanese and English. There are a couple of security roles. I want to say it was either with Sony. I think it might've been with Sony where it was saying, Hey, do you know Japanese? Right. So they were probably looking for those applicants that know that. So if you do know that maybe you could, you can use like Boolean searches to put, you know, English and Japanese in them and see what you get. And you probably be in a list of not too many candidates that, that know that. So that's also one of the things too, is like figuring out how to niche down and, and get stuff that everyone isn't applying to. Unfortunately, I'm not learning Japanese, but I, I, I do consider learning Japanese, but for the time oh, being, okay. I'm learning, I'm learning Korean because I'm Korean American and I'm also learning Russian, which is another language that I'm currently learning as well. Okay. Yeah. But I would say, well, extract what I say about Japanese, but put any other language that you know in there and see what you get. Nice. Well, thank it's you so very much. Uh, Robert, it's an interesting choice that you chose to study Russian. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> curious why, why Russian over something else? Well, um, I don't, I don't see a lot of Americans learning Russian because, uh, you know, people say, oh, it's a, it's a language of the quote unquote enemy. But I don't look at other people's nationality as bad or good. I, I, I think Russian, as well as other hard languages, uh, stand out more because everyone wants to say, hey, I'm learning, oh, I want to learn Spanish or I'm learning uh, French. These are like commonly uh, learned foreign languages among, you know, people in the Anglosphere. But I want to learn Russian because uh, as a kid, I've been reading a lot of history books and somehow uh, I, I read up a lot of uh, Soviet history and I figure, well, why not learn Russian? What's the harm of learning the language? And uh, fortunately for me, uh, after I got out of the military, uh, now, you know, since I don't have a clearance, I decided to visit Russia just to see for myself. And I fell in love with the country and I, I, I don't, you know, talk about politics or think about it. I just want to go with an open mind. And naturally, I just fell in love with the culture and I wanted to learn the language. I figured by learning Russian, I could learn other Slavic languages including, you know, Polish, Ukrainian, and uh, other lang like-minded language within the Slavic tree. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good reason. Yes, and also I want to learn Korean in part because I want to, you know, communicate, uh, you know, more with my family, and I figure, well, I got to catch up on brushing up my Korean as well. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Nice that we have any um, other questions. Richard, you got your hand up. Yeah, just to follow up on what Robert said, um, the current company I'm at was founded by two Russian immigrants, and they've maintained uh, our DevOps team with uh, a lot of Russians currently. So it's not an issue of, of nation states per se, uh, but you'd be surprised just how many different uh, corporate cultures have that in them. So every time I'm on, a, I'm on a Zoom with the DevOps, it's Igor, Pavel, and Sergey. Uh, so, and it would be nice to actually, you know, talk with them because a lot of the stuff they do on their own is Russian. So, they, but of course, when they're doing the U.S. base uh, conference calls, they're in English. But yeah, they're they're doing everything. Uh, I mean, after the invasion of Ukraine, the company had everybody get out. So now, now they're all in Eastern Europe. They're no longer actually in Russia per se, but they're still they're still maintaining that 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 corporate culture, and they're still doing everything in Russian. So yes, there is there is a huge dev culture that that does uh, everything in Russian. So more power to you, Robert. Thank you. Cool. Uh, uh, so uh, Henri, I I just have a quick question. So I talked to this issue with uh, Richard, Aiden, and Ms. Renita, but uh, currently what I do is a, a GSOC operator. So I deal with physical security. So um, 
the the main basis of SOC a- analysts and tree SOC security, like we do like the same, like I guess thematic purposes and protecting assets. So mm-hmm. I deal with more the physical world, I guess, and like cameras or access control, uh, et cetera. So how would I, as a GSOC operator, try to, I guess, transfer over to the cybersecurity world or like the SOC world in general? Because I know you mentioned uh, about possibly going into like help desk or um, just getting more hands-on home labs, but uh, it, what what other ways would there be possible and would it be necessary for me to be in a help desk position in the future? Good question. Well, since you're already doing GSOC stuff, you have a lot of transferable skills that just physical, right? So your goal is going to be when it comes to interviewing, it's like, okay, I know how to translate what I do physically to virtually. And, you know, when you really think about it, both are super important, but your job is important because, hey, you're protecting people. (laughs) Like if you weren't there and anybody could just do what they want to, like, it'd be crazy. So it's kind of those parallels that you have, right? The the difference is now, um, and I know y'all probably have like certain codes for something like this, right? It's just understanding like, um, I'm trying to make of a good analogy, right? Uh, perfect example, when I saw my unusual authentication. Now, do you, um, cause I know like uh, one of the, the places I worked at, the uh, physical security team was like on the, whatever floor they were on, but they used to look at all these different monitors and stuff like that. Are you one of the people that's like in the front of a building or do you work like in this control room? Uh, so I work in like a, a, what we call like a war room where we have monitors or data yeah. miners. So we see like weather or like if there's like a situation like a oh, protest in Peru or there's mm-hmm. a situation in one of our buildings in Germany. So that's what I currently do. So I'm more of, mm-hmm. I guess, like back end, <laughs> if yeah. you can say that. Now I have some clients like that. Um, but no, I mean, I mean, you guys look at all this stuff all the time. So I'm pretty sure you guys see like who's swiping in and out or maybe every so often look at the monitors of hey i've never seen that person coming there before so it's like the same thing like if you're working in the socks like hey i've never you know seen this alert before i've never seen this person has never logged in from this place right so it's kind of like you already had a skill set but you just have to figure out how to build a bridge to understand this portion of it so when it comes to your interviews you can say you know you probably say well i haven't did this uh, much but I do understand the totality, like what am I doing when it comes to this? Because it's similar to what I did in physical security. You know, I understand how this could be risky. I understand, hey, if I'm not paying attention, how this could, you know, implode on us in the same way, how you can correlate it to if I'm not paying attention at work and it's a physical threat where someone, you know, didn't, for whatever reason, maybe got a a scanner on the stairwell and they got through. It's like one of the same things. Somebody got through one of the defenses or the countermeasures on the network. It's, it's just knowing that. So I would say focus on, like I was saying earlier, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I would say focus on learning the skills and, and the same thing I was saying about projects, stuff like that. But based on your background or just physical security, you do have like a leg up because you do understand the stuff. You understand it from a physical level. And now you have to do is translate that over to a virtual and once you get in i think you'll do fine because it'll be the same thing like just knowing your environment and you'll be good gotcha thank you and so uh, since i'm currently studying in my master's for cybersecurity, what would that also help with i guess building my technical skills for future i guess positions yeah so what i do know about master's programs is they always give you guys some good projects to do whatever good project you work on or that really interests you, write it down as much detail as possible. So on your resume, you can actually list it as a project. And that yeah, uh, is going to, cool. oh, you go ahead. You can go ahead. Oh, so, so sorry. Yeah. Cause I, I, so for all my assignments and projects, I've been putting it in my, uh, a GitHub. So mm-hmm. just in case. And so, yeah, I'm just trying to land something in cybersecurity the world. Yeah. <laughs> Here, and, and here's a tip too, is like, you know, your, you may not go to a sock role first, right? Your skill set and some of the things you did in school may align with something else in security. So what I will also say, don't just get hung up on like trying to go the sock route. 
I would say just look at some other things as well. Like I'll tell a lot of people, hey, if you don't have like that much experience, look into uh, GRC. Like GRC is still big and they need people to do uh, GRC. And they pay good money for people to do GRC as well. And that's kind of what you do in a physical level as well, GRC. From the things that you guys have in place at whatever buildings and locations, y'all having that, that's in compliance with whatever buildings have to be in compliance for based on who works there and what type of data they have information to. So, yeah, I would say look into GRC roles as well. Well, uh, thank you very much, Andre. I really do appreciate your time. All right. Anytime. Maybe one follow up question. Over the years, what stands out to you? Um, you know, I hear you talk about, um, okay, I, 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 a small anecdote. I had went to an interview um, with one of the big four, and one of the final questions I asked him is like, you know, what do you look for in a member of the team? Um, and they manage a whole, they have a whole stock as a service. And he's like, you know, I have a team of over 100, and only like 10 of them are passionate about their job, passionate about their roles in the South. Um, everyone else does, they, the others can do the job, but the 10, they are passionate about the job. Um, that kind of scared me because um, being a big four, I, I understood what passionate meant for them probably working 80 hours a week. But for you, what, step, what, 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 can I, what do you look for in, in someone who wants to stand out and progress really fast? Like when I look at your career, um, I look at Dave's career. The progression is insane in this short period of time that you, you guys accomplished what you've accomplished. And so, you know, what are the main factors that lead to that kind of um, explosive growth so early in a career in cybersecurity? Yeah, good question. Continuous learning, continuous improvement. The thing about cybersecurity and um since we've been seeing, seeing like a lot of these things in big tech with like a lot of these layoffs, it hasn't been a lot of cybersecurity people laid off anyway. But the thing that keeps you in good roles and elevating is continuously learning. And in order to continuously learn, there has to be something that you are interested or passionate about learning. And I can tell you from experience that it's better to be at a job that treats you right and pays you well versus doing one that pays you more that you don't like. Um, and that's probably what they were alluding to. It's like, it's only a couple of them that's actually passionate. Like a lot of those people that's probably doing it will much rather probably do something else, but possibly can't get paid what they want to get paid. So that's one of the ways, like, if you want to keep on moving up, it's like, figure out what you're passionate about, what you like. As you go through your career, you will start figuring out what you like and what you don't like. Um, followers of mine know, I talk about a lot about, you know, what I do like and what I don't like. And that's me being 10 years in. Like, I thought I knew what I liked and don't like, but I really know what I like to do and what I don't like to do. I know what I'm passionate about, and I know what makes, you know, me want to close my eyes and go to sleep. <laughs> and I know that someone may laugh at that, but that's that's true. Sometimes you may have a couple of those roles in your career. And it's your job to get away from that role because it'll affect everybody around you. And that's not a good thing. So... One of the good things about being a SOC is if you like it, it's like, and you understand that, you know, your job is pivotal, you'll always give it your all and not have to do it. Because once you start doing that, that is sometimes when a big incident pops off. And someone can tell if people's been watching you or they're saying, hey, this person wasn't been picking up alerts. Like I've, I've dealt with that, like when we had like a, a big incident, it came from alert fatigue. Some people weren't holding their weight. It's a lot of different things that, you know, you kind of pay attention to. And that's why one of the things I didn't talk about that the SOC team also works with this team too, and I forgot to mention them, is insider threat. Insider threat is like a huge one. <laughs> the, that's a um, that's a, a field in cybersecurity that's talked about, but not talked about enough about why they're so important. So that's also something people can look into. It's like learning to look into insider threat and what you're looking for and, you know, learn about UEBA rules. And understand like that so you can catch somebody before they do something All right, so I, I don't want to take up uh, too much more of, of Henri's time I mean it's it's been an hour he's been been on with us close to an hour and a half so I think we should all say goodbye and uh, 
Henri, I, like this was one of the best like presentations we've had yet. So I mean, this yeah. was really good, and, and and your answers to questions. Usually, you can tell how engaged people are by are are they asking questions afterwards? You know, and and, and there's a lot of great questions. We, we could probably be on for like another hour, and people are going to keep asking you questions. Yeah. So yeah, man, you you did a wonderful job. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, then you can just like for those of you who don't follow me, I know a lot of you've been sending me requests on LinkedIn. I've, I've accepted them. Um, you could also like just tune in to me on my podcast. Like some of your questions, I've probably answered in like I'm in what I think episode seventy two would be Saturday. So some of these questions I probably answered already. And then, like I said, I'm going live Saturday. So if you do have a question that I didn't get to, if you just tune into the live stream and ask the question we can probably get it around to it then. And so I think that'll be cool as well. Uh, some for my POV and then something from, you know, a woman's POV. I think that'll give like some good insight uh, to the industry. That is excellent. Thank you, Andre. We really appreciate you answering every question with so much detail. And yeah, I have recorded this as soon as it's available. I'll share it with you. And to everyone who joined us on the call, thank you for staying with us the whole time. Thank you, Matthew, for bringing Andre in to this uh, our monthly meeting. And I wish you all a very good evening. Okay, you too. And um, just reach out if you know you need anything else with the class to help out with. Um, I'm in the area as well. That's excellent. I'll take you up that offer. Okay, sounds good. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Henri. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.